This episode is with special guest Joffrey McClung, who is the author of two self-love and healing books. In this episode, we talk about our inner orphans, how to use our emotions as a navigational system to connect with our higher self, to heal and to love ourselves, what is self-love, and how to play. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Embody Podcast, a show about remembering and embodying your true nature, inner wisdom, embodied healing, and self-love. My name is Candace Wu, and I'm a holistic healing facilitator, intuitive coach, and artist sharing my personal journey of vulnerability, offering meditations and guided healing support, and having co-creative conversations with healers and wellness practitioners from all over the world. Welcome back, everyone. It's great to have you today and to welcome the special guest, Joffrey McClung. She used to be an actress, and she is the author of a couple of healing self-love books. One is called The Heart of the Matter, and the other is called How Learning to Say Goodbye Taught Me How to Live. It was really fun to talk to her in this episode where she talks about her experiences with people in her life that have had cancer and how people in her life have mirrored her need for self-love or showed her different parts of herself that she needed to learn in herself or to heal up in herself. She began her career as a theater actress and producer, having spent most of her adult life in New York City, where she acted and produced several off-Broadway productions. And she was an avid student of spiritual literature and techniques since the early 80s because she wanted to learn and grow herself. She taught herself filmmaking and formed Sweet Moon Pictures Production Company in the 1990s, and then wrote, produced, and directed two independent films with spiritual themes and overtones. Those are called Out of the Blue and Best Wishes. Before moving back to Texas to care for her dying mother, she worked as a senior producer and director for a media broadcast production company in New York City for over 15 years. You'll hear in this episode about how her life took many different turns and she landed here in her passion through writing books, talks, and creating videos to support people in loving themselves and taking the journey to empower themselves. So without further ado, here is Joffrey. Okay, welcome Joffrey. Hey. Hey, it's so good to have you. It's great to be with you. I'm pumped to talk about all things self-love. Well, I can really <laughs> talk about self-love for hours, so we're in good shape. <laughs> yes. So you've written a couple of books. It sounds like you're also on another about self-love and really digging into how to do that. Oh, uh, certainly. Certainly. Uh, I'm actually redoing the second book, doing a new edition, so to speak. Uh, putting myself a bit more into the book. Oh, that's fabulous. So it's kind of a new edition, kind of a new edition, a new book kind of. And is that for the heart of the matter? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, Which is, you know, a workbook and guide, and it gives you the meditations and the questions to ask yourself. Of course, we have some dialogue in it. And I talk about different people I've helped along the way, but I kind of kept myself sort of generally out of it, except meditation wise, I would say what I did in meditation. But now I'm going to go back, I'm going to put myself back into it of, of what happened in my life, why I started something, what triggered me, you know, those, you know, give them my story. So they understand that I too came from a place of the lack of self love. So it's sort of a new book. And yet it's really a new edition. Yeah, and I really love that. Because that's what I feel from you that you you went on this journey for yourself. And that's what uh, these pieces, these books are pieces of the product of that, but that you really have gone through it and it's, it's in your bones. It's in your blood. Is that right? Oh, you got that completely. Yeah. <laughs> you got it very perfectly. It's in my blood. It's in my bones. It's in my soul for sure. Yeah. Well, tell me more, but first I want to read this little piece of um, what you've written on your website about the heart of the matter. And maybe it's in your book as well. And I'm wondering if that connects up with what you're saying of how you're bringing more pieces of yourself, your story. So here's the quote. We're meant to be whole, and that means healing and integrating those orphaned parts of ourselves. Believe it or not, every wound holds a forgotten gem just waiting to be rediscovered. 
and wounds are not only filled with unhealed pain, but also shroud your ability to dream and create, to feel joy and excitement, to have faith and trust, to live with passion and compassion, and most importantly, to love and receive, to receive love. I just, every part of my being agrees with that. Oh, I'm so glad because it <laughs> agrees with me too. <laughs> from my experience, uh, yeah, it it um, really it it came. I almost wrote that without me knowing I wrote it. To be honest with you, sometimes I'll sit down to write something, and it'll just start to flow, and that is sort of one of those things that flowed out of me because that's what I was going through, healing my inner orphans because we all have different parts of ourselves that we've forgotten or shoved aside or refuse to look at, frankly, that we're still carrying along with us in our adulthood that are making decisions for us that we're unaware of. So I was in the midst of doing that orphan, cleaning up, I would say finishing up my orphan work. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing the book, I was thinking about my orphan and how I really wanted people to have the courage to look at their own orphan. And that when I wrote that, I was sort of looking back at what I had done and realizing those orphans, the power and the gifts those orphans hold of ours, we go for a dream, but you're going for a dream with maybe 15% of yourself because the rest is shoved away, kept safe with your orphan that you don't want to, you know, deal with or you're disowned. So that really came from my own experience, I have to say. That's it. And it's so, I resonate with that. And as you were saying that, I was just thinking about the orphaned parts of ourselves that are still acting. It's like they insist on being seen. They insist on it. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our deeper self knows that we need that part. As you're saying, we have only uh, X percentage of ourselves moving forward and all these parts we're trying to shove away that are being orphaned or disowned. But there's a deeper part of us that wants to bring it forward. And they definitely speak up. Yeah. So tell me about that. They want to be heard. <laughs> they really, you can shut them down. You can ignore them for years. People ignore them for years, although they're still making decisions from that place. For a lifetime. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For many lifetimes. But they ignore them. But the thing is, they're going to start to shout because they want to be heard. They want to be part of the whole. And you keep disowning them, making them separate of the whole. So they're going to shout and they're going to get louder and louder and louder till you do something about it, either through drink or drugs, or you're going to heal them. Frankly, you have a choice. Uh, I, of course, decided to heal them. <laughs> yeah. But, and, you know, it's such an interesting thing because they get louder and louder and louder. And as I started to realize that, let me know how you experience this. As I started to realize, wow, wait, I've hit rock bottom here and that's when I learned that or started to look at that or, ouch, I had to get to this place, this pain in this big way to actually look at that thing that I knew was there. And so yes, it's like, yes. I'm learning, okay, why don't I just do that before it gets to be like a catastrophe? <laughs> because we have to learn that way in the beginning. I think every yeah. one of us who's on this journey to start it with a dark night of the soul kind of feeling, whether it's a big one or a little one, is because mm -hmm. something went wrong in our lives and it didn't work anymore and something hurt us. And so it makes us stop. And then we look at what we've been shoving down. So I don't think you're wrong in that. I think as we get wiser, hopefully, yes. we look at things before they hit us in the face. <laughs> and yell at us and stop us, you know, in our tracks. But I think that's typical. That's kind of yeah. how human beings, we feel like oh, we can ignore it because it won't bother us until it's shouting. And then as we get, hopefully, as we grow, we get wiser. And then we start to do the homework before it's in our face. Because yeah. now I'm there where I do it before it's in my face. Doesn't mean I don't get a whisper, but I'll get a little whisper, but I follow that whisper now. I don't wait yeah. for it to get loud. I'm right with you. And, and at the same time, there, my experience of the loudness, if it gets to that point, feels different. Like I, I don't resist it as much. I, I understand it a little better. I, I can be with myself through it and have compassion that it, that, that happened or what had built up for me to get to that place. But yeah, I would love to hear, Joffrey, about one of those dark nights of the soul for you or some some orphaned part of you that you you've looked at oh i have so many i could talk about <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> it's like which one do i think well the first dark night of the soul probably is the most important dark night of the soul because this woke, woke me up that i needed changing and i needed to look at reality slightly differently now that dark night tends to happen later in life for me it happened around 29 
And that's when I left a relationship with an ex I had. And he was a wonderful man, but I left it because I knew it wasn't right for me after nine years. And I went dark because suddenly I was back in my studio apartment, back in Manhattan, in New York, and mm-hmm. living back in my studio after I left a beautiful brownstone, lived a lovely life with him. I was mm-hmm. back in my little brownstone, doing my schlocky work, still doing audition work, but doing you know schlocky work to pay the bills. And I had a dark night because I thought, this isn't what I thought my life would be like when I was turning 30. And I suddenly realized Everything I believed was true, that I followed the rules, I went to acting school, I did my auditions, I fell in love, I did everything you were supposed to do to have a good life. And here I was with my life falling apart. That really hit me over the head. And then I started reading everything, every personal growth book I could read, every metaphysical book I could read. In fact, back then, this is how old I am, back then, the metaphysical books and the spiritual books were in the occult section. That is, oh I'm not kidding. Goodness. It was in the, it was in the mid, I'd say early eighties, mid eighties. Really, they didn't have a spiritual group or a new age group or whatever they call it now. Now mm-hmm. I think they just call it spiritual. They didn't have mm-hmm. that. They had it kind of, you know, put together with, in the occult groups. You had the witches over here and then you had a few spiritual books over here. So I started reading spiritual books and that's when I started to understand that we create our own reality with what we believe. That opened me up. Because I knew how what I how I was living was no longer working, and I realized I was carrying beliefs, and then I began to do some of the work. So that was my first dark night of the soul. Was really in I'd say 29 years old, almost 30, where everything was falling apart. It woke me up to the fact that we actually do create our own reality through what we believe. And I obviously had a whole lot of negative beliefs that were ruling my life at that time. Yeah, what did you see in yourself at that time as far as the beliefs that it sounds like they played out in your life in that way and brought you to that place of seeing there? Well, I had shoved them down in all in all honesty. I was doing my auditioning mm-hmm. in New York. I was doing producing off-Broadway plays, also being in them as well as producing them. I uh, began to make a few little short films. So I was, you know, doing what I loved, but not to the extent that I wanted to do it. And That dark night, I realized underneath all the, I guess you would call it bravado, although I wasn't particularly loud about it, but saying, yes, I can get this job. I'll I'll book this job. I'll get this commercial. I'll get this, you know, acting job. Underneath that was a feeling that I will never get that because underneath that was a feeling of lack of self-love that had come from childhood, things in my early childhood that I had made the decision that something was not quite right with me so to speak, because I had certain family members who were extremely uh, jealous and angry at me, and I took the blame for it. So I shoved all that down, but that was still ruling my life. Even though I was having the bravado saying, I'm going to this audition, I'm going to book it, but underneath with that feeling that I can't have what I want. There's something not quite right with me because I obviously piss people off Mm -hmm. (laughs) and make them jealous and angry at me. So there was that level, and there was also a level underneath that, a negative belief that I can't have what I want, because if I do have what I want, it's going to make someone jealous of me and angry at me and hurt me. So there were layers. It was dangerous. Oh, yeah. It was dangerous to have what I want. So there were layers, and I didn't know all that even in the beginning when I first started reading the books. It was just sort of opening my mind to the beliefs and and how we create our reality that work came a bit later but that was I was well aware that that was in there I was trying to heal it different ways not quite doing a great job at it but I was well aware that that stuff was in there and I wanted it out of my head frankly and then I realized it was also in my heart Mm -hmm. and that heart needed to be healed Mm. absolutely can't forget about the heart because it's holding all that pain Oh, it definitely holds that pain. You can you can do all the affirmations you want. You can do all the techniques you want. But if you're not healing the wound that's in the heart, you really just, I think I call it in the book, mental masturbation. Because you're really kind of playing with your mind, which is important. You want to change your mind. But if you're not healing the heart, it's carrying the wound. You're, it's, you're double lifting, so to speak. Yeah. When you really need to go to the root of the heart, get your heart in sync, then your mind can follow. I know that kind of sounds weird to people, but that's how it worked for me in all honesty. That's what this whole entire show is about. (laughs) Being embodied, (laughs) being in your body and feeling through what's here and healing those wounds. And I like what you said about double lifting because we're often, I think it's a couple of things, you know, so many of us have learned to 
use our mind to get through something and survive something because feeling it was too dangerous or hard or scary at the time or overwhelming. Well, or we were too young. Yeah. We didn't know what to do with what we were feeling. So we kept shoving it down or I call it shelving it. I just shelve it. Mm-hmm. Deal with it later. I'll, I'll deal with it later. And, you know, you realize years have gone by and you've been shelving everything. And then you're so good at it. <laughs> so you're good very at shelving. good at it. And actually, it does serve a purpose because there are times you do need to shelve something that you need to do when you get home. Like at right. work, I can shelve something. And then when I get home, I can go to meditation and look at it and heal it. So, I mean, in that sense, it's a good thing. But when we're little, we shelve it because we don't know what to do with it. And we also, when we're younger, we take everything as our fault. Mm-hmm. everything is our fault. doesn't matter what it is. Even though mentally I may have known this person is angry and jealous and that's them, not me. In my heart, I still believed it was me because those negative beliefs get, get built around what you keep experiencing. So another negative belief that came out of that was some, you know, something was wrong with me because otherwise I wouldn't have this person in my family that was so angry at me. You see how that negative belief get played out, even though it had nothing to do with me. In all honesty, it was her issue, not mine. But I obviously agreed to play with it when I came down here. So obviously it needed to teach me what self-trust and self-love. So I'm grateful to this this energy I was brought into. I don't ever want to do it again, frankly. I hope I learned the lesson. But I'm grateful for the lesson and the nemesis and for what she taught me because it did guide me to find my self-love and I'm very firm in it now. It took me a while, but I'm very firm in it now. Yeah, I can hear that. So when you teach people through the meditations and other practices how to heal the wound of their hearts, what what do you offer? What do you suggest? The way I start is I I introduce them to their tools first because I want them to know they can do this for themselves. I'm going to introduce them to the things, but they're going to have to do the heavy lifting themselves. They're going to have to go within and look within themselves. So I introduce them to their tools, their imagination, because you're going to use your imagination to dialogue with those inner orphans. I can't tell you how many times I dialogued with my inner orphan and learned something through that dialoguing. Oh, I did it this morning. <laughs> exactly. You see, well, you obviously know what you're doing. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people don't use their imagination except for worry. They're good at thinking the worst case scenario for work oh, or money or the relationship. That's a good point. You see people often using their imagination for worry. Oh, in, yeah. In a worry as adults, we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When we're kids, right. we use it to daydream out the window. See, yeah. we used it well when we were young, and then we grow up and we use it wrongly. <laughs> we start using it for right. worrying. I see that. Worrying and, and creating the worst possible scenarios. And what will I do if that does happen? <laughs> I mean, that's what we spend our imagination on. So I right. introduce them to their imagination. <laughs> I introduce them to their safe space. I let them use their imagination to meet their higher selves, uh, to, to create this loving space, to add images, to kind of wake that part of their brain up again. So they realize, oh, I do have an imagination and it can be loving to me. It doesn't have to be the worst case scenario. So I introduce them to their, their, uh, imagine their imagination to their higher self, which is just the part of you that still knows it's one with the divine and carries with it all the knowledge and power of that love, which we all have. Some people call it their innate one. Some people call it their intuition. I don't really care the name you call it. We all have one, but it's the one that sees 360 degrees around, sees the forest and the trees at the same time. It's your wise one, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And you can tune into that part of yourself in meditation, which I know you do. I have no doubt to, to aid you in your journey. So I introduce them to that. And then I introduce them to their third tool, their emotions. People are so afraid of emotions. And the thing is, your emotions are part of your navigational system to move through this world. But we shove so many emotions away because we're afraid of anger or rage or hurt or fear, whatever it might be, that we don't get the lessons from those emotions. Those Mm -hmm. emotions are trying to talk to us and tell us something enough. They're fine with anger, but getting to the hurt underneath the anger takes them a little bit, you know, longer time. Women are a little more adept at going to the hurt underneath the anger. So I introduce them to their tools. That takes a little time. And then we go into uh, talking about what self-love is. Because we can talk about self-love, but until you define it for somebody, it just sounds sort of woo-woo-ish, so to speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want self-love. Well, what the way I define self-love. 
for me, and I help them get it, is that it's the part of you that knows in your heart, because I've got to include the heart, that you are lovable, loving, and loved. And then we go and we break that down further. What is lovable means? It means you are worthy of love. You exist. Therefore, in the universe's eyes, you are worthy of love. Does it matter if another person ever gives it to you? You know you are worthy of love. Loving means that you know you're given a loving heart. That is your natural state of being. You have a naturally loving heart. And how you express that loving heart is more than good enough. How you express that loving heart is more than good enough. And loved simply means that you matter and are valued by the universe. Not for what you do, not for what you will do, but because you are you. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to do anything. You simply are loved because you exist and you are and you matter. So we go through that and then we get to the orphans, <laughs> mm-hmm. what you yeah. and I have talked about. Because mm-hmm. as you well know, the orphans are key because they will shout you down. <laughs> and for good reason, you know, there's a, that, as you said, this whole load of energy that's waiting for you there and all the, the goodness that uh, is like a treasure box waiting to be discovered within what we've closed down. But at the same time, there's pain, there's fear and other emotions that are harder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, there is great treasure with with the orphans because they hold so much of your dreams, so much of your joy, so much of your power. You need it back, frankly. We're supposed to be all that we can be. And if you're keeping parts of yourself away, you can't be all that you can be. So then I introduce them to their orphans. And each person's different. Uh, certain orphans take longer to bring out. My, I had several. Now, they're all sort of the same, but I saw different images for different, when I was working on different beliefs from that orphan. Some would be hiding in a cave. The first one I met was mm-hmm. hiding in a cave. Unwashed, dirty, matted, filthy, did not want anything to do with me. Did not want to look at me, didn't want anything to do with me. So it took time just to gain trust from that orphan. Then I would, after I worked with that one for a bit, I met another version of the orphan, and this one was shouting me out. It called me into the woods, and it shouted me down. (laughs) It yelled Uh at me, shouted at me, screamed at me, had a tantrum. It's the one that needed to have a tantrum. Yeah. Yeah. So I let it have a tantrum, and I listened, and I said, that's just horrible. I'm so sorry. And I just listened. So you meet your orphan, and you listen in the beginning. Sometimes it's just, if they won't talk to you, you just say, I'm here going to sit here and be with you. You may do that several times. And then they may start to say something to you or do something or have an image for you, whatever, however your brain works. Some people, it's images. Some people, it's words. You'll know when it's real. And then you'll, you'll begin to listen to them and say, I want to hear what you have to say. And they'll start to tell you, either shouting at you or one which just crawled into my lap, just mm-hmm. crawled in my lap and boo-hooed. So I just held it and let it boo-hoo. Because it needed to boohoo and be loved. Another one needed to have a tantrum. Another one needed to ignore me. So you deal with each orphan, and they really come from the same place, but you deal with each orphan as they need to be dealt with. It's their time, and it teaches you how to have compassion for the different parts of yourself. Because you're learning how to have compassion for yourself. Does that make any sense? Oh, completely. Yeah, that's what I'm practicing almost every day at this point. You know, what I find is that there are ways that these parts of me want a certain kind of loving or acknowledgement and being with that usually is just what I didn't get before. And the hardest part about that is that it sometimes I didn't know what was needed. But as the ball got rolling with some support from other people, my healer, many healers along the way, it just started to get easier and easier. And, and now it's, it's like second nature. But how did you find that place for you? How did you know what was needed? How did you know how to give it to yourself? Well, like you, I had a lot of teachers and healers and, and helpers along the way that would show up and give me information. So, I mean, I certainly didn't do this on my own. I had a lot of helpers and healers and a lot of books also. Mm-hmm. And I sort of put it all together 
because I would do one thing and it wouldn't get me that far. I would get me so far and then it would stop. And then I would get information from someone else and I would add that to it. So I sort of did layers. And then I began to say, you know what, I can do this. I, I know how, because being an actor helped a lot because I am able to dialogue a lot easier than people who aren't used to dialoguing. Because I would practice lines. So obviously practicing lines, it's like talking to your orphan. Yeah. So it, in that sense, it came a little easier if you're in the in the performing arts than somebody who's not. And there are times I didn't know the answer either. And those are good times. Meaning that is means you're going to leap when you get it. When they're tough and you can't seem to get the answer and you keep hitting the same wall, that's a good sign that you're getting ready to leap or you wouldn't be hitting that wall to begin with. That's the way I started mm-hmm. to see it happen. When I hit that wall and I kept going back to, let's say, a particular orphan and kept getting sort of semi-answers, but not the full answer, not knowing what I needed to give them in return to bring them back to wholeness, it would be so frustrating. And so I'd go deeper with them and I would uh, listen a little deeper and then I would find a new level and eventually I began to get hits of what it was they were needing for me. And it was my higher self who really helped me the most. I am key on working with your higher self. Like I said, I had uh, a healer. I had people that channeled that I worked with. I had a lot of good guides and teachers, but really it was my higher self. Mm-hmm. In the meditation, I, I always have everyone bring their higher self into meditation when we're working with anything, frankly. But definitely when you're working with your orphan so that you feel like they're holding your hand as you're holding your orphan's hand. So as you're talking to your orphan, mm-hmm. your higher self can be talking to you. So my higher self would be the one because I would be boohooing with my orphan over whatever they needed to vent because you're feeling what they're boohooing. You're feeling it as well. So I would feel that. And then when they were done, I would turn to my higher self, boohoo in her arms. And and then I would get information from her Beautiful that I had not gotten earlier. So really, it was the mm-hmm. higher self work that really came from a channel that I had worked with who said, you've got a higher self that's dying to work with you. Keep working with her. So I kept mm-hmm. working with my higher self and I got that really strong. And so when I started this orphan work, she was right there with me. Sometimes I turned her and say, I don't know what to say to them because I believe everything they're saying. I would literally, I'd feel their pain that what they felt when they were young. And I'd say, I'm sorry, but I believe what they're saying. They were, <laughs> right. I, I'm right there. <laughs> this is they're me right, right now. <laughs> it was horrible. They didn't deserve that. I can't help right. them. And I would turn to her and say, what do I say? And she would give me one sentence, one word, whatever it was, was enough to calm me down. And I'd be able to offer that word to the orphan and calm them down. And then I could start the work again. Beautiful. So that's the best example. So higher yeah. self, I think, is key in doing any inner work, whether it's self-love work or creation work, because I use her for creation work as well. But your higher self is key. And again, it comes from images or words. It doesn't, it's not going to be big dialogues. My higher self doesn't give me huge you know, paragraphs of wording, but she gives me an image or a word or a look or something that says it all. Beautiful. And I can roll with that. So really a higher self, I'd have to say, was my biggest yeah. helper and also my teachers. What a lovely reminder. Yeah, it's it's such a good reminder of everything is within. And I, I do experience that. It really is. And you need your teachers and you need your books and your seminars and your lectures or whatever it is, because we need to be around other people who are doing what we're doing. So that's a good thing. And you're always going to have the help you need. But just like you said, everything you really do need is already inside of you. And part of the journey is figuring out that you can find it inside of you. And sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes it's tough. But that's okay because you start to trust that you're going to find it. And you do. And like you said, it does get easier and easier. At least I found that way. (laughs) Yeah, I have too. And sometimes it's gone up and down. But then at some point it started to get like more smooth sailing in a way. But um, I'm wondering, Joffrey, what frustrations or challenges or struggles have you had lately? Well, lately, I would say the biggest struggle is um, I have a family member who has liver cancer. So outwardly, I'm dealing with cancer again, which I dealt with eight years of everybody around me dying. It, I'm not saying that to be funny, but it was true. Uh, my mother got cancer. My best friend, like my soul sister got cancer. My aunt and uncle died. It's like every, that eight years was literally everybody dying around me. And of course my job in New York city all kind of left and I moved to Texas. And then I had three year break and those three mm-hmm. years I wrote the two books. 
And I thought, okay, this is a new path. This is not a path I had planned on, frankly. I always thought I'd be more performing, but this is still creative. Writing is creative. So I thought, okay, this is a good thing. And then all of a sudden, uh, in January, I got the word that a family member had liver cancer. And I, that sort of took me by surprise. And I thought I was kind of done with the, the C word, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, outwardly, that sort of threw me. But in a weird way, because this person is also the person who mirrored for me my need for self-love through her jealousy and anger, it's sort of, in a weird way, I don't know how to say this, except to say it's also a bit liberating. I know that sounds odd to people, but when that person leaves the planet, because they will at some point leave the planet, I truly will be free. Hmm. I'm free now, in all honesty, but I will literally, truly be free from all past uh, ties, so to speak. So really will begin a new life for me. So I'm sort of going back and forth, kind of struggling with it, and yet owning that that's what I'm feeling, so I shouldn't disown that's what I'm feeling. It's what you're feeling. So that's what I'm feeling, Kansas. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. And do you, do you mind me asking if that person is currently still mirroring that need oh yes yeah, she did that recently right like in the same way as before she did she has not mm -hmm. healed a thing to be honest I don't think this lifetime it's I think she had her opportunities when she was younger but it's not going to happen is she mirrored it a couple of weeks back out of the blue uh the jealous rage came at me sort of caught me a little off guard because I wasn't expecting it and when I hung up, I said, this kind of got on me. So I did a quick meditation and reminded myself who this person is because it was so shocking because I she had not done that in quite a while because when my mother was ill, I would not have it because mm -hmm. uh, my mother also received some of the jealousy. So it sort of caught me off guard. So I did a quick meditation, got it off me and reminded myself who this was and that what she said does not mean it's true. Because anybody who's dealt with people who are angry or jealous, they tend to bring in other people to their conversation. Well, I'm not, not the one saying it. Everybody's saying it. That tends to be how they work. Mm -hmm. They like to add people to the to their blame of you. To back it up. Exactly. And it's, you know, you can see that out in politics now. I won't get into politics. But you <laughs> see how people yeah. bring that up. Well, they said, you know, people say, when I hear that, I think, uh-huh, you're saying it. No one else is saying that. You're saying it. Right. It's easy to fall in that trap, but <laughs> you're saying you know better, you know. Yeah, I do, it, but I caught, it caught me off guard for a moment. I thought, oh, my God, people are saying this about me. And then mm -hmm. I thought, first of all, these people, I don't know them, so who cares? <laughs> and then I thought, wait a minute. I, I know how this energy, this bully energy works. They always bring in other people to back them up, even though they're actually lying. So I had to remind myself of that fact. And so I was able to forgive it. And then I, I said, you know what? She's not going to get it this life. I got the lesson I needed from her. So I blessed her in that sense. But her energy still has it. She still has that anger energy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still talking. I, I'm still friendly with her. I'm going to go see her next week. I do love her in that sense. I do not particularly want to be around her very much, but I do love her and I, I do wish her well. And uh, I have put out my order for my next life. She's on her own in her next life. <laughs> she, I, she's going to have to work on jealousy again and I'm not working on jealousy. Oh, again. right. Like, like you don't want to be paired again. Is that what you're saying? No, exactly. <laughs> right. I don't mind that we pass, we pass in the hall or something's fine. But as far as being family members, I think I'll skip it the next life till she gets this jealousy <laughs> thing over Put with. Put your order in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm done with it. I got my lesson and I've learned it and I don't need it now. <laughs> Oof. Sounds like you've had a lifetime of learning that. Yeah, it was intense. I have to say, and we all have something within our families or in our childhood or friend, friends or teachers or something that if you came here to wake up, you're going to have something that happens to you. Absolutely. Something that's not so pretty, that's going to get you and bring you down so that you can build yourself back up in some form or fashion. Mine happened to be from sort of that anger, jealousy, bully energy. Other people, it's something else. Mine happened to be that. And, uh, I learned my lesson, but, uh, yeah. so that's sort of what I'm dealing with now that it's okay to kind of be okay that it's, I'm, I'm going to be free from it. Wow. And still bless her, you know, and still wish her well, but I will be free from it. Uh, 
fairly shortly, I would presume. Yeah. No, I think you're touching on something about how you can see the reality of your life, like how you can see the experiences that are happening to you. There is a relational component. There's the care that you have for her. There's also the, the other feelings that you may have. And there's this other level of what it means to you and what this person has represented for you and shown you. And they, they don't always sound relational. Like that, that mm-hmm. portion doesn't always sound relational as you're saying, like, it's a little bit hard to say this, but this is, I'll be free of this. Well, but yeah, that it makes complete sense on that level. Well, it's true. And the thing is, what's funny is the reason I can sort of see her separate from me, I meaning I can see and bless her for what she taught me, is because, again, in one meditation I went into, I did a meditation to understand how this person is in so much pain. Because somebody who comes from a bully or jealous or angry place is carrying a lot of pain. Even though we may not want them around us and they've hurt us horribly, we have to intellectually know they've got a lot of pain to act that way. So I went into meditation so I could better understand where she's coming from so I could find forgiveness for her. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, finishing up that little matrix for myself. And I went to meditation and I saw her as a five-year-old and what she must have felt and how she felt so unseen, unheard, unlovable. And I got to the fact she felt so unloved. And once I felt that, I was able to understand why she was so full of anger and jealousy. So I was able to forgive her for how she behaved towards me. I still don't want it around me. I still have my boundaries, but I can understand her pain that she's carrying. And also that I agreed to do this because I needed to learn to take my power back from bullies and jealousy and angry people. Because obviously that was the thing I needed to work on. So there's sort of layers in there. But I mean, when you can go into meditation and, and figure out what that person, why they're being so hateful to you and understand what kind of pain they have, it does give you some release. And then to realize when they do, because I do believe in many lifetimes, I know other people may not, but I happen to, that I realize Mm -hmm. she's going to have another chance to get it. And that's fine because I told her and thanked her for showing me what I needed to get. And I did a whole thing on that, thanking her. I didn't do it to her face because that she would not take it well. But I thanked her for showing me what I needed to learn about self-love and that I got it. So even though she may not have succeeded at jealousy and bullying, she did succeed in teaching me what I needed to learn. So she did do that well. Mm -hmm. So I did a whole thank you meditation on that to Mm -hmm. thank her. Mm -hmm. She gave you such a beautiful opportunity. Mm Mm-hmm. And painful one, but beautiful. It was painful. It was ugly. I gotta be honest. I, I don't wish it. it on anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, it sounds worth it. Would you say? Well, again, if we look at life is here to teach us something, and we're here to learn and grow, then you got to figure out there's something here that's good. There's got to be right. something good in this bullying and jealousy, anger. So I dealt with that, and then I learned self love. So it was a good thing. Yeah. But it, yeah. It, I don't wish it on anyone, but again, that's how we learn, isn't it? Down here. Yeah. So I'm curious, as a writer uh, and as an actress as well, what's the title of the current chapter of your life? That's a good question. What's the title of this chapter of my life? Begin again. Hmm. I just got that. Begin again. Because I feel like this is a brand new life. I've let go of my old life. It was a good life. I did it. I did it well. But I've let it go, who I was, uh, what I wanted to do, sort of the dreams of youth and middle age. I sort of let that go mm-hmm. and said, okay, what's this again? I've, I've done my healing. I've done my orphan work. What is what is I want to do? And now I'm doing all this spiritual writing. So it sort of began again in a sort of a brand new life with new fulfilling ideas, new dreams, new hopes, kind of like starting over again, frankly. I actually have one affirmation I do that I'm now in the best years of my life and all my, all my remaining years are my best years. Mm. So I sort of feel like this is my new beginning, beginning again. Yeah, 
I would say definitely that. That's really exciting. Because we do get many chances to begin again, frankly. I mean, I, anybody who thinks that when you're in your 20s, you think you're going to live one kind of life, certain kind, certain kind of framing. By 30, I have this. By 40, I have this. By 50, I have this. Well, I've got news for you. If you're going to live a full life, you might as well throw that away because it's not going <laughs> to live up to that. It's going to go to the right, to the left, up and down. It's going to go all over the place as it should. And hopefully, I'm on my third life, Frank. You know, they call it the third act, but really it's a third life. Yeah. <laughs> I have my 20s and 30s. I have my 30s and 40s. Now I have my 50s and 60s to look at. So it's like, you know, okay, I'm doing a whole new life. I may have another one after this. I don't know. I can't look you that You may have many. <laughs> <laughs> but right now I've got my third act going, so to speak. Yeah. You know, I, I so relate to that. And I feel those words to begin again and the, the refreshing space of not knowing and being so it sounds like so joyful in that, so open about what's coming. And it took me so long to get here. And I still come across these, they're just fewer now and less big, I think. But the expectations I didn't realize were there. And then I bump up against it. And I'm like, wait, what is that? <laughs> what is oh, that big <laughs> disappointment? Or what is that that I'm fighting for? But do I really want that anymore? Is that a past part of me? Like lately, I've been wondering, do I really want children? Or was that mm -hmm. just something of the past, you know, my 16-year-old self that decided I wanted two kids? And what part of me still wants that? Do I really want to get married? All of these things. Oh, that's a good, you're in a good place. That's a good place you're in. Because those are questions. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, that's serious. I know that's I, I believe that you're in a good place you're in. But that's, that's a good thing because, you know, as women, we're raised for, even when we're little and younger, we're raised with certain things put in our heads. We were supposed to get married, supposed to have children, supposed to have this by 40, supposed to have this by 50, all these ideas. Yeah. And I think it's a good thing to stop and, and, and hit an age and go, do I really want that? I kind of knew, weirdly enough, that when I was younger, I remember announcing to my parents when I was in high school that uh, I was never going to get married and I had no intention to get married. And if I did get married, I would never take their names. <laughs> I was really big on that. <laughs> For some reason, that was a declaration. I would not take their damn names is what I shouted when I was in high school. <laughs> Uh, and what's interesting enough is I didn't get married. Now, I did live with someone for nine years and had a, a loving relationship, and then I moved on. But I kind of knew that in high school. Mm. Although I still thought in my head, oh, I probably will get married. I'll probably have kids. I'll probably do what I'm supposed to do. But, in, but the truth of the matter is I kind of knew I wasn't going to live my life the way my mother had lived her life. Something in me told me I was going to do it slightly differently. Mm. And boy, did I do it differently. It sounds like it. <laughs> Yeah. So I think that's a good thing to ask yourself. Do you want oh, to get married? Do you want children? Maybe do you do you want to adopt children? Maybe you want to foster kids. Right. Maybe you want to have children that you're helping therapeutically. Yeah, who knows? Someone asked me, do I want to be a grandmother? And I was like, yes. And then I was like, wow, I really have a dilemma here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if I want kids, but I want to be a grandmother. But you can be a grandmother to children without having to have kids. You can. There, you never a possibility. Will find yes. a way. You may find through your therapeutics. You may find a group of kids that need some help. You may find kids who. This is so true. Again, if you want to be a grandparent without having to actually raise children. Universe can find a way. That I do believe. So I think you do want children. You may not want to give that. birth to children. <laughs> no, I do. I want that part. I, I have a really special place for birthing and for oh, mothers okay. and babies. And I think it's the, and I used to be an art teacher and um, do a lot of therapy with kids and families. And so I think I just kind of got children out. <laughs> a part of me okay. has, you know, just kind of right. got burned out on that. And, um, but the years of like two to I don't know, 20, maybe is what I'm not sure about. <laughs> and, you know, I have so I have so many friends right now with young babies, and so I get the joy of, of going in and then leaving. And going well, then, in. There is something good about leaving the children once you've loved them and played with them. There is something really <laughs> lovely yeah. about not having to go through that, and I've been go through teenage years. Yes. There are some good things. I, and actually, again, depending on what your beliefs like, I know I've done children many lifetimes, so it was like this lifetime I took a break. I knew I needed to do my inner work. Uh, somehow, I didn't know that, but I knew it. If that sounds odd, I thought it was all going to be about acting, but now I look, it was all about what I'm doing now. My whole life has oh, been built to this moment. Although I love acting and I still love acting. 
but, uh, and I'm actually using it when I teach classes in a weird way. I'm sort of being a performer. So in a weird way, it all comes together. But um, I think <laughs> what you said about leaving, having children and being able to leave them is not a bad thing <laughs> to be able to sweep <laughs> But also, you may changing who you are, who you were when you were twenty, and who you are in your thirties is different, and who you're in your forties is different, and your your dreams do change. Like you were saying something about beginning again, that that was a good phrase. But and I look and I realize when you've done your homework and you've healed, really healed your past and healed your orphans, and you're coming from a rooted self love, you do get a new life, and your mm, dreams absolutely. do change. Yeah. So you may have new dreams that you may not have even considered now that you be healing things and moving and more into your power. You may, those dreams may be completely different and you got to leave room for that. Got to leave room for it to be different. That's absolutely what I've experienced in my life. And someone had asked me recently, like, when did you get involved with horses? And their, their perception was I've been with horses forever. And I think that is true on some level, but in this lifetime, I only started being with horses one year ago. And that really? surprised this person a great deal because I've been really in it now. And that was the gem coming out of that moment was we can change our life any moment. We can shift something so big. And I, I do feel like that is a big shift, shifting my life to be around horses and be with them. It's it's continuing to unfold, but I would have never known that five years ago, 10 years ago, especially, you know, when I was, I don't know, 15, 20 years old, deciding, trying to decide what my life would be like. But I have definitely found what you're saying as well, that each step of healing, it's, it's more opening and then more comes in. Things I didn't even know would mm -hmm. be ever involved in my life. So that's really cool. You have that too. Oh yeah. And you don't know that that's part of growing older and getting wiser. And not just because I say older and I have to be careful because I know older people who have no wisdom. So I've got to be careful with that. <laughs> there are people who get older who leave the planet and not learned anything. But if you stayed awake and as you get older, you begin to realize that life does bring you new things when you're ready for it and you've done the work for it. You were ready for the horses. And what's funny is you probably had many lifetime with horses. I feel that. Yeah, it's coming back. Probably had deep connection with horses. And so you did whatever you needed to do to be open now to receive those horses that you didn't even dream of when you were 15 or 16 or when you were 20. That's what the universe get. Like, I didn't dream of writing books. I thought I would be in, in, on Broadway doing my, and maybe doing some film work and living my life. And then all of a sudden my life took a 180 degree turn and I had to do something to pull myself out of that second dark night, which was when everybody was dying around me. And I decided I'll write. I'll write what I'm going through. And I wrote the first book, which was helping my friend deal with stage four uh, breast cancer. That was a 180 degree turn. And I wrote that kind of angrily, to be honest with you. <laughs> I thought, hey, okay, you know, emotions as navigation. There you go. Oh, Lord have mercy. I was like, hire self. You want me to write about what I'm going through? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I just want to get back to what I was doing. And I thought, well, I'll do it. It'll get her quiet on my back. <laughs> get get this out of the way. <laughs> go back to what I was going to do. And I'll, I'll write this darn book. And I'll, I'll then I'll wake my, my inner self up. And I wrote the book. And that, that kind of got my creative juices going. Yeah. And then when I looked at it a few months later, I thought, okay, I, well, I put the word out there that I'm spiritual. Everybody, you know, I had two groups, those who knew I was spiritual and those who knew, knew me in uh, my career. I kind of kept them separate. And I thought, well, the word's out there now. They now know that I'm <laughs> You're a out. spiritual person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm out in spiritual closet, so to speak. Now I went and I looked at the first book. I thought, you know what? I got to really say how I got to self-love. The first book talks about when we're in self-love, but we don't tell people how to get to self-love. So I wrote the second book. But all this is to the point, I didn't plan on that. This was not part of my plan. And yet when I look back at my life, I realize, of course, it was part of my plan. Mm. In fact, I wrote a movie with my best friend who the first book was about. And we wrote a book together in the movie. Oh, how funny. <laughs> and she always wanted to be a teacher. She was a channel and she spiritually did all her spiritual stuff together. And we were also actors together. And she wanted to be this. She wanted to do what I'm doing. Oh. Now, she passed on. 
And I can hear her laughing going, yeah, I want to do what you're doing. You're supposed to be doing what you're doing. Uh And she's like, I'm already out. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not. I'll do that the next line. But I thought how weird that I did a 180 degree turn and I'm actually doing what my best friend did that I put in a movie 10 years before I knew it. So the universe is funky. <laughs> well, well, we are funky, right? We like leave ourselves clues and then forget about them or like ignore uh-huh. them. And then we find them later like, wow, right. <laughs> it's just weird. I, when I wrote that in this book, the second book, and I thought, man, that's that, that first uh, short film I made. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh I my really God. did it. Yeah. Even though it was just a film about, you know, making, creating dreams. Yeah, it was a little film about creating dreams. But uh, so the universe, you may have horses now. Who knows what you're going to have in five years? I have Who no knows? clue. <laughs> no clue, but I have some ideas. But then I, what I know is that keeps changing so much that I just don't put too much to them except for the ones that are like right now and yeah. coming up. Living in the present. I told mm-hmm. a friend recently he was getting all fachotted, so to speak, because he was thinking, oh, I'm getting older. What's, what's going to happen when I'm old and I don't have a place to He went way down the pike. And what he didn't have and how old it would, how horrible it was going to be when he was old and didn't have any money. And I said, first of all, you got to stop going that far down the pike. There's nothing you can do that far down the pike. You're just putting something in your head and getting yourself all ah. excited about it. I said, I've learned now that my life keeps taking these weird angles. I look about maybe three months ahead. And that's about as far as I look. Just to mm-hmm. kind of know, okay, this is where I'm going. This is kind of what I want to create. And I don't look much further because it keeps me calmer. I don't sit there and think about what am I going to be doing five years from now? Because I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. I am right where you are. Actually, that's exactly, exactly where I am. And it's funny because my dad has started to realize that about me and he is the planner. Oh, is and he? he <laughs> and, and that's where my planner, the part I've got of a me, planner. yeah, no, that plans everything and wants it all planned out it comes from like the desire for security and stability comes from him. And, Lately, he's realized, yeah, I don't plan more than about two months ahead anymore. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, right. That is, that's, that's you. <laughs> well, that's a like, thanks, hey, that's good news that he gets that. <laughs> he gets it. A lot, of, a lot of people would say, no, you need to be planning now. For that's what he used people. to say. <laughs> that's what he used to say. And he's like, are you sure? You know, like, that's not, I don't think that's going to be okay. And no, dad, it's okay. <laughs> With the, you've taught him, see, you're actually teaching him something. <laughs> That's the cool thing. He's seeing something different. Something. Yeah. Yeah. And he's saying that, hey, my way may work for me, but you know what? It doesn't have to work for everyone. So you've taught him something. Thank you. That's kind of cool. I, I mean, that's, a, <laughs> that's now he's so intertwined. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's so intertwined with my lesson with him because one of my lessons with him was to be in myself and trust myself and not not allow his idea to be mine. Got you. It, which was mm-hmm. like, I experienced it as more imposed on me in the past out of his own care and fear. Always out of love. But, I mean, always. right. Always. But, um, so we've both come a long way. Well, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. So I'm going to switch gears. Um, I, I recently had this dream oh. that I, I lost this beloved water bottle. <laughs> Wow. Okay. And you love this on an airplane. I loved it so much. I just, I loved it so much. And I was devastated in the dream. And when I got home after my flight, my mom said, my mom said, you know, you're just probably better off without it. Just let it go. You're better off without it. And here I am in this dream, kind of like obsessing over how am I going to, how am I going to find the next water bottle the better, like, no, this won't do. And that won't do. I wanted that one. And she's like, you're probably better off. And so that's been sticking with me and I'm that's experiencing. A good dream. That's yeah. A, I love dream work. I love I was dreams. wondering, that's leading to my question. I'm wondering what have you dreamed lately that in your night dreams? Well, you know that your mother in that dream was your higher self. Most likely you do know that. Yes. That was and it is my self. mother too. Yeah, it's both. my mother. Yeah, exactly. But my higher self, when she first appeared to me, and uh, she appeared at looking like a beautiful version of my mother. 
Oh, sort of in a half dream so state that I was sweet. doing. Yeah. And then she sort of shifted up. Well, I have to see her anymore. I just feel her. But, but yeah, that's definitely your mother. That's mm-hmm. definitely your higher self saying you don't need what you think you need. You've outgrown it, is what she's really telling you. You've outgrown. Right. It's time to let go. Uh, <laughs> I used to do so much dream work when I was started. Uh, I've always done dream work. Even when I was younger, I'd have, I'd have dreams over and over again. And then when I started the spiritual work, I'd have really mega dreams. I call them epic dreams. One symbol after another symbol after another symbol. And I worked with them, you know, worked with them Mm -hmm. immensely. And all of a sudden, when my mother passed, my dream stopped. And I thought, what's happening here? I've never not remembered my dreams. And they just stopped. And I was like, okay, this isn't good. Because, I mean, I had dreams where I had guides talk to me, my higher self talk to me. I would go to other planets. I would see symbols. I would talk to my, you know, I did a lot of homework in my dreams. Mm -hmm. And my dreams just stopped. And I remember dealing with a channel that I worked with. And she goes, well, you don't need your dreams right now. You're grieving, number one. And you're doing your homework. Because I was doing, finishing up my homework on my orphans. I was grieving, so I used the energy for my orphan work. And they went away for a while. And that was really scary for somebody. I don't channel. I don't do visions. I don't see entities. I don't do any of that stuff. But I did dreams. And I could really help people with their dreams. So when I didn't have my dreams, that was kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm happy to say my dreams, they sort of come back, not to the extent that they were for years. But now when they come back, there's just a quick message. And then they drift off. Just a quick message. I had one recently that was so cute. I was calling a kitty in. And kitties being that feminine energy, calling a kitty in. And with a kitty was a little fox, like a baby fox, a red-faced little fox, red and white-faced, like almost like a cartoon-looking fox. And it was there saying hello to me, and it was so cute. And I said, well, all right. Well, I guess you can come in, too. So I let it come in the house, and that was the end of the dream. I'm saying they're so short now. They used to be epic. And I thought, what in the world was that message? <laughs> what so this world sweet. was this fox? Other than I love animals, obviously. Mm-hmm. But I thought, interesting. I thought, well, that feminine's healthy. I'm letting the, you know, taking care of the feminine energy. And I thought a fox is sort of like a, sort of got that feminine energy, but it's also got a wise energy to it. It's got a smart energy to it. It's got smart, wise. They, now the negative is sly, but when you take the negative off and put wise, smart. I thought, okay, I must be, because I've been asking to have my my teacher awaken a bit more. Since I'm doing this, let's awaken my inner teacher a bit more. So I took that as a message that my inner teacher is awakening. That's how I took the fox. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's how I took it. Thank you for sharing your dream. And I also hear that begin again right here. And that this fox baby is with, with the kitty, which is so spiritual. And it's this new birthing, new energy coming in to begin again. Mm-hmm. You're totally right. That's why it was a child fox, not a yeah. not an old fox, but a, a newborn, ready to go little fox. And I thought, well, all right, you're so so cute. I'll let you in the house, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm grateful for. I used to have dreams where the image would scare me. I used to have a lot of snake dreams, and I was afraid of snakes, and I didn't like it. Yeah. But I understood the information the snake was giving me, and then eventually I began to hold the snakes in the dream, which I was really grateful for. So I was happy it was a fox and not a snake. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I have one more question for you. I love, I loved that. Um, this is a different one. Um, in your group of friends mm-hmm. or in your friendships, what role do you play? I would say caretaker slash uh, almost a little bit mentor in a weird way. I've always been a caretaker, uh, I'm cancer and at nature. Um, so I do take care of people. I like to put the dip out, put the chips and put the drinks. You know, I take care of people, make sure they have what they need. Um, but I would say I'm also somebody, when somebody is in deep trouble, I tend to be the one they call. Mm-hmm. That's, that, that's why I say mentor. I don't know the right word. I'm not sure mentor is the right word, but when they're in trauma in there and they have drama or trauma, I tend to be the one they call. So whatever that that energy is, I tend to be that one because I stay calm. I think having been raised around a bully, I'd learned to stay calm in the midst of a lot of drama around me. Yeah. So I can stay calm and help them. So I'm hoping I help people. And also I'm pretty fun. I do remind people the most important energy is play. Yeah. I'm big on play. I hear that in you. Play is so important. I cannot tell you. 
if you can't play, you need to look at what you can't, why you can't play. Cause you need to add play to your life. People. It's <laughs> you need to have play in your life. People. You do. You need to play for no reason, but to play. How are you playing now? I swim in the pool. Uh, we have in the backyard, I swim and I play in the pool. I play with the animals. The kitties. I, I did actually have a fox here a year ago. I talked oh. to the fox. I talked to the birds, to the squirrels, to the little possums, the little raccoons. Uh, I, I dance. I put music on and dance. I love to dance, so I dance. I just like to play. That when my friends will put on music and dance and laugh. Uh, I just like to have a good time. I like to play such a euphoric <coughs> energy and such a creative energy and it's the energy of how we create our realities when we're in a place of joy so i'm trying to move in more into play mm-hmm. so i can create from that place of joy versus creating to keep the pain away i don't need to do that anymore yeah. <laughs> right right <laughs> i need to play and create with joy <laughs> now i have one last question for you and it, it connects with play and it connects with roles as an actress What roles did you play in the past, typically, and what would you do now? Or what would you be interested in now? In the past, I tended to play um, probably firm women, strong women. I was taller than most most of the women in my class. My voice can go deeper, so I play strong, firm women, which I was very comfortable with. I'm very good, you know, I like that a lot. I would say now I would add a bit more... I won't say humor, but a bit more, um, oh, what's the word? The word's right there. I can't find it, but it's a bit more sass to it than I used to be allowed to have because I was always the firm one, the strong one. Uh, I would say a bit more sass, a bit more irreverent than I used to play because I was, like I said, always the strong one, the firm one, Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the domineering kind of woman, uh, career woman usually cast as strong. Mm -hmm. I would say a bit more sassy. I play a bit more sass, a bit more yeah. fun, a bit more irreverent. Yeah. A bit more re- uh, rebelish because that's really what my spirit is, even though outwardly I may not appear <laughs> rebelish. No, I, I can, I can rebel. hear it in you. You have fun here. <laughs> you, have, you definitely have strong, firm woman in you. But this rebel, fire, sass, and fun, like it's like busting out of you. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you weren't sure. I do not hear it in your voice. So I would say definitely a rebellious, sassy kind of woman. A bit of swagger. Oh, big swagger. A big swagger. But a, but a kind swagger. A kind swagger. But a swagger. Yeah. A loving but a one. Kind. <laughs> a loving. You got it. A loving swagger. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've taken it now. Loving swagger. Coming a loving right swagger up. with a big laugh. Yes, that's with what I would laugh. like. <laughs> That'll be your description on the podcast episode. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jeffrey. This is oh. lovely. Is there anything else you want to share before we go? Uh, just if you're interested in any of my books or, or if you happen to be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I'm doing some classes. You can check it out on my website. Other than that, just uh, keep doing your inner work. It makes a big difference, people. Absolutely. Big difference. Thank you so much. And where can people find you, Jeffrey? You can find me at joffreymcclung.com. You can also just type in it's all about selflove.com. I T S all about selflove.com. And it'll take you right to my website. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. You are such a doll. I thoroughly enjoy talking to you. Oh my gosh, I enjoyed this so much. And you are so much fun and you provide so much wisdom. Thank you so much, Joffrey. And um, all of the links that you shared, everything you're sharing here, will also include on the show notes. The episode is at candice.com slash Joffrey. So all of that's there for you. So you don't have to go digging around as well. And I'm just so grateful you are here today. Thank you. Thank you. And have a great day, hon.